You've tuned in to the Community Cats Podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats Podcast. I'm your host, Stacey LeBaron. I've been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. And today we are speaking with Sandy Reese, who is with Get Fully Funded. Sandy is the founder of Fundraising TV and the chief encouragement officer at Get Fully Funded, where she shows passionate nonprofit leaders how to fully fund their big vision so they can spend their time saving lives instead of worrying about money. She's helped dozens of animal of small animal welfare nonprofits go from nickel and dime fundraising to adding six figures to their bottom line. As a trainer, she shows her students how to find ideal donors, connect with them through authentic messaging, and build relationships that stand the test of time so that fundraising becomes easy and predictable. Sandy has served as a volunteer and board member for a variety of animal rescue nonprofits, including Animal Legal Defense Fund and Horse Haven of Tennessee. Sandy is a cat mama to two long-haired cats named Praline and Taffy that she foster failed with. To find out more about her fundraising system, you can find out more at GetFullyFunded.com. Sandy, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. (laughs) We're going to have a great chat today. I'm just, I am very excited too. First and foremost, so we have to find out, how'd you get to be so passionate about cats? Oh my gosh. I had actually a dog growing up and we had sort of a neighborhood cat um, that I was fascinated with and my mother didn't like him. And so she created for me this this interest in cats by making it almost taboo, you know, where she's like, oh, this is a mean cat and you don't want to pet him. And I didn't, that was not my experience. And then when I was in college, I was living by myself. And I had this little apartment. I got kind of lonely and I don't know why, but I decided I'd go to the shelter and see what I could find. And I adopted this little kitten. He was a tiny little thing cream, I guess, but almost white with big blue eyes. And he became my buddy. The guy that I was dating at the time said, we need to name him Cali because that's short for Calico, but he's not a Calico. It'll be funny. And I'm like, you're an idiot. But anyway, that stuck. So he was Cali and I had Cali through my first marriage and a divorce, the birth of two children, another marriage. Like Cali was with me by my side forever great cat. He, I can tell you a lot of cool Cali stories. And that was just it. I loved cats. You know, a lot of people's, oh, I don't like cats. They're not friendly. They're not social, whatever. And I'm like, you just haven't been with the right cat or maybe you're just weird. I don't know. I love cats. I love cat people. And clearly I still have cats. I fostered a couple of itty bitty babies last year and I thought they were going to get adopted and all the visits fell through. And ultimately I said, you know what? I'm just going to keep these two. And they're a couple of knuckleheads, but they're my roommates. We get along great. So many of the organizations that you work with are pretty small. What does that mean? Like how small is small? Gosh, we've helped everything from somebody who hasn't even started their nonprofit. They're just thinking about it to all volunteer organizations that don't have any paid staff and they don't want paid staff because they like being able to tell people that 100 percent of their proceeds go to programs. And I get that. Although we've worked with multi-million dollar shelters as well. So pretty much everything in between there. Typically, the organizations that we help have maybe a founder, and that's the only person who works in the organization full time or the only paid person. And then they're surrounded by a team of usually volunteers, maybe a couple of contract people or some part-timers. So I'm very familiar with what that's like and what that struggle is for that person who feels like they're the Lone Ranger and they're doing everything from triaging phone calls to setting traps to trying to write grants to interfacing with the accountant on their 990 and and more. So we're I'm very familiar with that and what that's like trying to juggle it all. Is fundraising hard to do? For some people it is. It doesn't have to be. And some days I feel like that's the the banner that I that I ride into battle with is this does not have to be hard. But I totally get where that comes from. So as I think about my own experience, and I was not somebody who grew up thinking, oh, I want to be a fundraiser for a living. 
But I remember being in grade school. I remember first grade, second grade, somewhere around there. And it was a public school and we did fundraisers. And I remember the guy comes to school. We're going to sell these candles. And he's got everybody in the gym and he's getting us all pumped up. If you sell this many candles, you get this hat. If you sell that many, then your your whole class gets a pizza party. And you know, we're little kids. We're all like, yeah, this is great. So I took my little candles home. They were ugly as homemade sin candles. I, you know, looking back on it, I wish I had a picture. They were so ugly. And I remember getting off the bus and going door to door to my neighbors. And every single door I knocked on, the answer was no. Some of them, it was because they had kids at my school who also had just come home with these ugly candles. And some people were just, no, they didn't want candles or whatever. And I remember feeling so defeated. And I remember that day I decided fundraising is hard. And I think that happens to a lot of us. Somewhere along the line, we have that experience, we decide it's hard, and then we carry that with us for the rest of our lives. So how in the world did I shift from this is hard to this is a lot of fun, I like doing it? I think it's a lot of little pieces, a lot of little steps in between. I remember as a teenager, the youth group that I belonged to, we decided to do a holiday food basket for a family. And I was so excited about it. This was going to make such a difference. So we're all collecting food. We're all bringing our thing in. And, and my dad, he pissed me off. My dad said, what do you think they're going to do the rest of the year? Instead of, this is a good thing you're doing. You're helping this family the holidays. Because well, what do you think they're going to do the rest of the year? And I was mad because he just burst my bubble. And then I started thinking about it. He's right. What are they going to do the rest of the year? So I start asking questions. And I start looking for ways to help people at what I call unexpected times and moments of need. So that, and there were a few more experiences. I won't tell the whole story because it gets kind of long. And what I found was when I started looking for those opportunities, they started popping up in all kinds of places. There was always an opportunity to help somebody. And then I started working in the world of marketing and then found my way to fundraising and figured out that that actually wasn't that different. And I tried some stuff. And I think at the time, I was ready for a change. I don't know that I would have gone into nonprofit if I hadn't been ready for a change. But I looked at it and said, how hard can it be? And that was a time in my life where I was really using that as a mantra. And I was attacking a whole lot of, lot of things in life with how hard can it be? And went into it and found that I was actually pretty good at it. Because it wasn't about begging and it wasn't about hitting anybody up. It was about connecting with people and having conversation. And when I realized that, quote, donors are people who have discretionary income, they care about the work that the nonprofit is doing. They just don't want to actually do the hands-on work. It's easier for them to just write a check or hit a donate button. When I finally understood that and I said, my job is not to beg. My job is simply to give these people a way to connect with the work my nonprofit is doing. It was like everything became crystal clear. And I said, oh, uh, this is easy. I can do this. This is not about me. So I don't have to worry about rejection because if somebody says, no, it's not about me. It's about this is not the right time for them or this is not the thing that they want to support right now. And everything became easier. And I found the more I did that worked, the more I celebrated, the easier it became. And I built my confidence and built my skill. And it, and it just snowballed. Yeah, was this for a animal group or for a human services group? Because I also hear a lot of folks say, oh, well, it's so hard to raise money for animals. It's so hard to raise money for spay neuter. Or people only give to dogs. They don't give to cats. I mean, I hear every reason why we can't fundraise. And have you seen any of these lines come true? Well, the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence, right? I can't tell you how many times I have told stories about the food bank that I worked at and people say, but that's the food bank. You had hungry kids. And then I tell stories about the horse rescue that I worked at and they're like, yeah, but that's horses and everybody likes horses. It doesn't matter what story I tell. There's always somebody that says, but we're not like that. Our cause isn't sexy. And the truth is, every cause is sexy. You just have to find it. 
you have to look at it and find the sexiness and pull that out in a story to share with people. So I get it that a lot of people like dogs more than cats. That's fine. You know what? Those people are not our ideal audience for raising money for cats. The end. Totally fine. Let that go. Let's go focus on the people who do like cats because there's tons of them out there. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. And I, I do feel like it. you're talking about connecting. Here you are. You're sharing stories with us, being authentic. I think that's really important is this is who we are. These are our needs. And I know one thing that's really important in your storytelling journey or as you work with different groups is really ensuring that there's specifics to that storytelling. So there is this is what we do, but you have it drilled down into something called a core number. And you don't have to go into the details about it, but just in general, why is a core number important and sort of what is it? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that because it's a tool that helps so much in fundraising for a number of reasons. Number one, it gets the focus of the story or the conversation in the right place. A lot of people think fundraising is about begging, and that's one of the reasons we don't like doing it. People dread it because they make it about themselves. And when you use a core number, which is basically an expression of what it costs you to deliver a unit of service. So a core number might be one spay-neuter surgery, or it might be one... Um, if you do a whole lot of TNR, it might be one capture or, or if the, the cage and the surgery and the tear and everything. It might be one round of vaccinations, just depending on what somebody's organization does. So when you can say to a donor, your gift of $35 is going to help us catch a community cat, get it fixed, make sure it's healthy, and return it to where it goes, so that... We're preventing unwanted litters in the future. So your gift of $35 or 50 or whatever it is, is basically saving hundreds of lives that this cat would have created. And so when you do that, it's not about, hey, would you please give to my nonprofit, which feels really yucky. And instead, we're getting the donor to imagine and envision how their donation is going to make a difference. That's exactly where you want them to be because you're putting that donor in the space of being the hero of the story and they see how they can prevent unwanted cats. And if I were telling that story, I could go on with that. Like, let's imagine for a minute what it's like for those cats. There's nobody to feed them. There's nobody to pet them. They have no toys, no bed, no safe place to sleep. They're always worried about predators, about other animals. Like you just start pushing on the emotion of what somebody might feel. And that person's immediately going to go, oh, $35 to prevent kittens from suffering. Yeah, I'm in. Where do I click? And you've worked with several groups um, on developing their core number. They've never worked with fundraising TV with your group. Want to share a couple of examples? Sure. We have done a lot of work in the animal welfare space. And um, I I love it. I absolutely love it. And it's really funny. Personally, my rule is when I go visit a shelter that we're working with, I do not go in the kennels. <laughs> I do not go in the area. <laughs> I brought home a couple of kittens once, um, but I just like I can't deal with it. I cannot handle that that work. My my strength is in fundraising. So I'll stay in the conference room. We, I, we can talk about it all day long. I'll let you plan. I'll let you figure it all out. I can't do that. Um, but we've worked with lots and lots of shelters. The One of the first times I crunched a core number for a shelter was the uh, Humane Society of Southeast Missouri. They're actually called SEMO Pets now. It's um, Cape Girardeau is where they are. They recently changed their name. And so they were... They were raising money, but not as much as they wanted. And and the way they were asking for money was very much help us meet our goal. We have a goal of $10,000. Help us meet our goal. And I said, what about that is inspiring to a donor? And they looked at me and said, gosh, uh, nothing, I guess. And I said, you're right. So let's look at a core number. So we calculated it. And it was $6.20. That's what it cost them to take care of a homeless dog or cat in their shelter, $6.20 a day. I said, okay. Um, so we used that number 
and started raising money. And they said, what we'd really like is more monthly donors. I said, okay. At that point, they were bringing in, I think, about $1,000 a month through monthly giving. And it took us about probably about six months or so of using that number on the regular. So we would put it in an appeal. We were posting it on their social media. We used it in a lot of different places. And, and our approach was basically to say to somebody, if you can't adopt or if you just want to help these animals, it only takes $6.20 to provide a day's worth of care. And that includes food, shelter, veterinary care, vaccinations, and play time. So we're just listing it all out. And it exploded. People got it. And what I've found, I mean, you may know Erica Wasdorf. She's a, a friend of mine and an expert in the monthly giving space. And Erica says if you can get an amount that's about 10 bucks or less, it's a very easy yes. Like people don't, a lot of people don't even have to think about that. That's just an easy, well, of course I would do $6.20 a month. I'm not even going to miss that. You know, that's basically what I'd spend at Starbucks one day. So we use that, but we also use multiples of it. So it was $6.20 per day. And then we would say, here's how much it is for like their initial intake period, which was three or four days. And here's how much it is for a week. And here's how much it is for the entire stay. Because at the time, their length of stay was only 21 days. So we were able to say, you know, you can fund an animal for the entire stay. And guess what? People were jumping all over that because they got it that, oh, I can provide care for this animal for the entire time that it's here. Yes, I want to do that. Sign me up. It was like 40 something dollars. It was still not a great big, it was a 40 something dollars. No, that was a week. Anyway, a lot of people jumping on it and it really, it worked. By the time the dust settled on all the things we did to grow their social media, we were at like 3,000, 3,500, something like that. It was amazing. So they went from having about a thousand a month to 3500 a month like you can feel that that's enough money that that's going to help pay for things that that's a chunk that you can pay you can use it for whatever you want to you can pay that on your vet bills or use it to buy food or vaccines or whatever you need do you need expert help taming feral kittens for adoption watch the taming feral kittens and cats full-length workshop video now available for free on the urban cat league youtube channel go to youtube.com and search Urban Cat League to see all of their videos to benefit community cats. Are you ready to take your learning to the next level? Get your hands on the only all-access pass to all things Community Cats. The Community Cats Pass with Community Cats Podcast. This one-time purchase will ensure you're registered for all of our full 2024 calendar. That's all events, webinars, and workshops. From the online cat conference to the online kitten conference, from TNR to surrender prevention certification workshops, your 2024 Community Cats Pass will ensure you never miss a minute of cat saving content. Turn your passion for cats into action all year long. Grab your pass today at communitycatspodcast.com. In animal welfare, there's always someone to talk with and learn from. Check in with hundreds of animal welfare colleagues every Monday at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern to have your chance at $5,000 just for attending. These 50-minute calls are a collaborative space to share exciting new programs and research, discuss uncomfortable topics, connect with peers in the industry, and more, all while sharing a common goal of preserving the human-animal bond. Go to forum.maddiesfund.org to register now. You can also watch on demand if you can't make it live. So we are entering into the holiday season. Well, I guess I would say we are almost, we are in the holiday season. It's middle of November here. And so if I am a small organization and I've just been so busy all summer long, everything's been crazy. We have a late kitten season. Is it too late for me to do any holiday fundraising for my organization? No, it's not. What you've missed at this point is planning time and preparation time and early season time, but it is not too late. So here in the middle of November, you've still got time to send out a fall appeal and ask your, your donors to give toward the thing that you need money for the most, even if that's just help us take care of cats, help us do more TNR help us with more spay neuter, whatever that is, as long as you can tell the story in a way that people get why it's important and why they need to give now, it's all good. You've still got time to put together something for Giving Tuesday, which is just a couple of weeks away. And I always get tickled about Giving Tuesday. Sorry, that's Southern for it. It makes me laugh. 
I get tickled about that because a lot of people just poo-poo Giving Tuesday. I've got a colleague who says, it's like Hunger Games for nonprofits. And I just laugh. I'm like, clearly you uh, have not had a good experience with it. We have found a formula that works, and it's all about in being prepared and asking for something specific. People love giving to something specific, even if that's cat litter, cat food for special needs cats. I've done pain meds for cats before. I've done incubators for cats before, for teeny tiny little kittens before. Horse rescues typically do hay campaigns. And all of these things work really well. And that's stuff you've got to spend money on anyway. So you may as well use this as an opportunity to put some focus on it because you can educate people and raise money at the same time. The trick with Giving Tuesday is you can't wait until that day and just post a couple of times on Facebook and feel like it's going to work. You have to plan this out. You've got to tease people. So you could you could post something this week about, hey, Giving Tuesday's coming up. We're going to be raising money for fill in the blank, whatever it is that you need money for. Go ahead and mark your calendar. By the way, if you want to give early, here's the link. So that's a great approach to take. And you just tease it a couple of times. And then you've got to be able to share some good stories. Uh, All of our clients who are going to follow the formula have video in the can to share on Giving Tuesday. They're ready to post multiple times on Facebook on Giving Tuesday and send out multiple emails. I usually get a lot of resistance there because people say, oh, we can't post that many times on Facebook. Some of my clients will post six or eight or 10 times on Facebook that day. I know. Everybody just went, what? You can't do that. No, actually, you can because most people are not going to see all of those posts. They might see two or three, maybe. They're not going to see all of them. You have to post frequently in order to get people's attention, in order to capture they're uh, capture their attention while they're scrolling in order to work with the Facebook algorithm because Facebook's not going to put every post in front of all your people. It just doesn't it doesn't work that way. And if you email out, you catch people when they're busy during the day, they're not going to open all your emails. So it's perfectly OK to email a couple of times during the day, especially if you're telling good stories. If you're showing a quick little video of the cats that you're helping, if you're doing things that are interesting to people. They will open, they will click, they will read, they will respond. So that's really the trick of it. So even though we're here in the middle of November, it's not too late. Giving Tuesday is still an option. And then you have the whole month of December. And honestly, the the interesting thing about holiday fundraising is that the closer you get to New Year's Eve, the hotter the opportunities get. Now, it can be difficult to get people's attention right around Christmas. And whether you celebrate Christmas or not, you probably, you may have donors who do. And there's a period there where a lot of people may be traveling. However, even if they're traveling, they're still on their phone. They're sitting in somebody's living room, like on their grandma's couch, and they're on their phone. So sending emails can still be a very good thing. I wouldn't send things through the mail past about the 1st of December, 5th of December, because it's just going to get lost. But email can still work really well. And actually, that last week of the year between Christmas and New Year's is a very, very hot time to raise money because people are trying to get their last minute gifts in, whether or not they plan on taking the tax benefit. So don't think that they're giving for tax purposes unless they itemize, unless, unless. Most of the time, you can simply say, you've got three days left to give for 2023. That's all you need. People go, oh, 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 the dead- deadline's coming up. I've got to make a gift. Oh, yeah, let me do that. Click give. What about making phone calls? I mean, would we either do a thankathon or an askathon? I mean, is using the phone? Does anybody answer the phone these days? I don't know. Yeah, some people do. You know, 20 years ago, I used the phone a lot. I would use the phone to make thank you calls. And people were always a little hesitant when I tell them, this is Sandy from blah, 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 nonprofit. They go, yeah. And I could almost feel them like they're leaning away from the phone. And then when I told them I was calling to thank them, they would go, oh, I could just, you know, I could hear them through the phone, just relax. Phone calls are still a thing in some cases. So it may depend on how many phone numbers that somebody has. It may depend on how how close of a relationship they have with donors. Most organizations, even the small ones, have a handful of donors that they know a little bit about or that they're close to, or these special donors who tend to show up every year with a big gift at the end of the year during the holidays, or they're the ones you can call every time that you need something big. 
Most organizations have those. If you have that phone number, November is a real good time just to call and say thank you. Don't ask for anything. Just call and say, hey, we really appreciate what you've done so far this year. We've done this, this, and this, and we couldn't have done it without you. Thank you. So that's a really good time to do that. Thankathons can be real powerful and a great way to engage board members or volunteers. So if you have, let's say, 20 or 30 donors that you have phone numbers for, or if they're friends of board members or volunteers, gather everybody up. You can script this out really easily and call people and say, hey, it's the holidays. We just wanted to call and personally say thank you. Um, I have found that to still be effective. For those organizations that say, well, I don't really have any phone numbers, I would not go look them up. I would only use them if people have given them to you. We're all real hesitant about answering the phone when it's a number we don't recognize. So if you do have a lot of people that you don't have phone numbers for, but you have email, what you can do is for your best donors is to shoot a personalized thank you video where you shoot the video and in the video you say, Stacy, thank you so much for your support this year. We've done this, this, and this. We couldn't have done it without you. If you ever have questions, please reach out. I'm here for you. Thank you for being there for us. And then you throw that on YouTube. You make it unlisted. You email it to that donor and watch the magic happen. Personalized thank you videos for your top donors is magic because people watch it and then they go, ah, they shot this just for me. They could call me by name in this video. They did this just for me. Oh my gosh. And they can't believe it. One of our shelters, did that. This was probably four or five years ago. So they did this for about 10 of their top donors, which it's going to take a minute, but probably not more than an hour of your time. Once you get the hang of it, you can shoot these rapid fire, load them all up, email them out. It's, it's really not a big deal. And it doesn't cost anything other than your time. So they sent this out. One donor had, it was a couple, they had just sent in a gift of, I think it was about $2,000. And for the shelter, that was a big deal. So they shot this video in the kennel, holding a puppy. Thank you so much. Little Pablo here is getting all the care he needs. Thanks to you, blah, blah, blah. And so about a week goes by and the donors send another check for $3,500 with a note that said, thank you so much for the video. Now, were they going to send that money anyway? Don't know. Did that video prompt them? I'm really, really sure. So, and that's not the only story I can tell you about thank you videos. So you can send the personalized thank you video. You can also just send a general thank you video where you, you don't want to say, hey, to all of our donors, you just say, thank you so much for your help. So you don't call anybody by name, but it still feels very personal. And we like sending those out on Thanksgiving Day here in the U.S. Because think about it. <laughs> what are people doing on Thanksgiving Day? If you have a family gathering, you have your, you do that, you're cooking, whatever. At some point, you're going to sit down and start looking for sales from your favorite store. So you're in your inbox, you're checking it out. And if there's a email from one of your favorite organizations with a hooky subject line, you're going to open it and then you're going to watch the video. And then you're going to say to your family, oh my gosh, I just got this cute video. Come here and see this. And yeah. there you are. So what about events? Should groups think about doing events during the holiday season or volunteer appreciation parties, any of that? Should they think about doing that during that part of the year? It can work. I would not start now and plan something from the beginning to do it. Um, so you have to think about what, why would you want to do an event? What's your purpose? What do you want to accomplish? If you're trying to raise money and you think you're going to throw an event together in a couple of weeks, may or may not work. I don't want to say it can't work because I've seen all kinds of crazy things over the years. It could. It might be more important to do some kind of mix and mingle. Maybe you have an open house at your, if you have a facility of an open house, you invite in your top donors for wine and cheese just to say thank you. The trick with any kind of event, it doesn't matter if it's a donor event, a, a donor cultivation event, a volunteer appreciation event, I would not do those past the second week of December, because if you start asking people for their attendance, you're not going to get what you're looking for. People are very busy and there are all kinds of holiday parties and things. But I have seen things like a shelter 
hooked on to a community event that was happening in their community where the whole town did this huge Christmas thing and there was a parade and they did luminaries and all the stores were open late and there was the the kids choirs were singing and like all of that. And honestly, it was the shelter that did the luminaries and they were they would sell those a couple of weeks ahead of time and then they set those up and they were responsible for cleaning them up later. And they made thousands on those luminaries at like 10, bu- 10 bucks a pop. It was crazy town. So I never want to say that can't work. So sometimes what you do is you look around and you say, who's already doing something where they're doing all the heavy lifting, they're planning the event, it's well known in our community, and a lot of people are going to be there. And the people who are going to be there are our ideal donor prospects. So if there's something that's already happening, you might could put something together and kind of tag on to that event. Um, I just, I, I'd be really careful about where you want to spend your energy at this point, because for the next six weeks, it's basically Mr. Toad's wild ride, you know, fundraising wise, buckle up and hang on because it's going to get more intense and more crazy the closer you get to the end of the year. So I'd, I'd be very cautious about where you want to spend your time and energy uh, because you're just going to get more tired the closer we get to New Year's. Makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. And then, you know, if we're sitting here and it's November in 2023 and we're like, OK, we're going to turn over a new fundraising leaf and we are going to really plan and organize in 2024. How can fundraising TV help? folks? Or what is it that you do to help folks to be able to plan throughout the whole year? And and what does that service do for folks? Thank you for asking. So Fundraising TV is our training and coaching and support service that's incredibly affordable. It gives people a lot of resources so that they never have to wonder what they should be doing next. We have step-by-step guidance. We have templates. We have samples. Like, We basically hand you everything you need to figure out any part of fundraising. In January, we're going to do our fundraising blueprint workshop, and that guides people through the process of creating a fundraising plan. What I find with a lot of small organizations, especially the ones where it's one person or maybe one person and a few volunteers and part-timers or whatever, although I've even seen some bigger organizations with this problem, they don't really have a plan. They have a couple of ideas in their head. They're like, yeah, we'll just kind of do what we did last year. Nothing is written down anywhere. And let me just say, if it's not written down, it's not real. There's no accountability. There's no responsibility with it. It's not going to happen. If it's all in your head, it's kind of like saying, I need to work out and lose some weight. I'll start Monday. You don't tell anybody Monday comes and you're polishing off a pint of ice cream. You're like, yeah, I'll start next Monday. There's no support there. There's nobody to say, excuse me, why are you eating that ice cream? You really shouldn't be doing that, but you need to do this instead. So that's really what people get with fundraising TV and fundraising blueprint. And we'll be sure and and give everybody, give our listeners the links to all those resources. Because the truth is what I hear more often than anything about the workshops and the training and the support that we provide is the accountability is really what makes a difference. The truth is you can go online and search and you will be overwhelmed at the information that you will find about how to do fundraising, how to write grants, how to run an event, where to get sponsors, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of information out there. And the problem is it's hard to know who to listen to and some of it's contradictory. But the real crux of the matter with anything is the self-discipline to go sit down and do it and do the best you can. And then who do you ask when you have a question? How do you keep yourself accountable? And that's really where where we come in and help people answer the questions, get past the roadblocks and the stuck spots, overcome the obstacles, handle any mindset that comes up that says, well, we just asked for money two months ago. We can't ask again. You probably can. You got to do it right, but you probably can. So that that's really where we shine is helping people figure out that they, they actually can do it and they can be successful and they can make it fun. Fundraising doesn't have to be hard. If we circle all the way back to where we started, fundraising doesn't have to be hard. Uh, one of our, I'll tell you one more story. One of our clients runs an animal, uh, a farm animal sanctuary in Jacksonville, Florida. When she first came to us about three years ago, she was working a full-time job, had just applied for her 501c3 and had this big dream. She could not see herself asking for money. That holiday season that year, she was very uncomfortable to even try to raise $200 on Facebook. 
We did a lot of mindset work together and a lot of coaching. Last year, during the holidays, her goal was 50000 and she raised fifty six. So we did a big uh, happy dance with her. By the way, uh, two years ago, she quit her full-time job and went full-time in her organization. So she works full-time in her nonprofit now, which is very cool. So um, look, she's she's special, but she's not special. She's special, but she's no different than anybody listening to this podcast. This is doable for everybody. Everybody has what it takes to go raise the money they need to fully fund their organization, to grow, to help more cats, to save more lives, to do what their mission is all about. It's all doable. Passionate. You've got the passion. You got it in do. Spades. You do. You've got the passion. So folks are interested in finding out more about fundraising TV. Where would they go? And I am going to quickly add that this is not a paid, you know, it, conversation we you know there's no sponsorship here this is because i believe in sandy i believe in the work i've known sandy for years i believe in the work that you do i believe in the affordability i believe in the scalability it's very practical it's very easy to understand the checklists that you have i just believe in the product that you have the team that you have so just to go on the record and say this is just stacy saying Sandy offers a tool that I think every organization should have. So how would they find that? Thank you. I would love every organization to have this because then they're going to raise more money and change more lives. And this world is going to be a better place. Can we all have that? Hallelujah and amen. Um, the best place to start is getfullyfunded.com. And from there, you can find fundraising TV. You can find information about our workshops. And we'll be sure we put in the show notes uh, specific links for fundraising TV so everybody can find it. Excellent. Anything else you'd like to share with our listeners before we close out today? Happy holidays. Happy fundraising. And certainly if there's anything that, that my team or I can do to help, come find us at GetFullyFunded.com. We are happy to help. That's what we're here for. Excellent. Sandy, I want to thank you so much for being a guest on the show. And also you are a very frequent presenter at many of our conferences. So I want to thank you again for supporting those. And I uh, hope we'll have you on the show again in the future. Sounds great. That's it for this week. Please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review. We love to hear what you think, and a five-star review really helps others find the show. You can also join the conversation with listeners, cat caretakers, and me on Facebook and Instagram. And don't forget to hit follow or subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss a single show. Thanks for listening, and thank you for everything that you do to help create a safe and healthy world for cats. Wow.